It's fair to say that most, if not all, eyes are on Congress this week and the upcoming inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden. But here at home in the Capital Region, we have our fair share of major breaking news. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the week's top headlines. Stefanik said that it was a badge of honor to be ostracized, to be canceled, to use the, uh, the term du jour. We'll discuss the issue of coronavirus vaccine hesitancy among communities of color in the capital region. The overriding theme seems to be they just don't trust the vaccine. And we'll talk to Russell Sage College President Christopher Ames. You've got to be flexible. You've got to plan for different scenarios. We have done that. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. All right, let's start with a look at what appeared this week in the Times Union and on timesunion.com. We are here once again with Times Union editor Casey Seiler to go over this week's top headlines. Let's start at the top. There are some safety concerns, some security concerns, um, and some warnings from Albany Airport at the New York State Capitol as uh, the, in the weeks leading up to President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration. Can you expound on those a little bit? Yeah, and while all of these reports are shadowy, law enforcement, both at the local, state, and federal level, are warning that there is chatter on far right and militant platforms, um, the ones that remain, that there is to be or are to be protests, especially at state capitals in the days, you know, basically between the end of this, this week and next week's inauguration. Now, whether or not they will be protests in the walking around the Capitol uh, or walking literally around the outside of the Capitol because he can't get in right now, waving banners or something more lethal, uh, of course, is something that, that law enforcement is very, very concerned about right now. State Street in downtown Albany, which is the street that uh, kind of bisects uh, the two most significant parts of the Capitol complex, the state capitol itself and the Empire State Plaza and the complex of more modernist buildings over there, has been closed down. And that is the first time in my memory that that has ever happened um, for anything more than a, you know, a couple of hour stretch. Uh, there are Jersey barricades up blocking off that portion of the of the street. This just happened a day or two after the raid on the U.S. Capitol. And it's fairly remarkable and yet another example of the fact that we are living in, a, unfortunately, um, interesting times. Indeed, the barriers are certainly formidable. I drove by there the other day um, and definitely echoing what's going on in Washington. And on that note, obviously, uh, the top news there is that President Donald Trump was impeached twice. But there are more local angles to that in that Representative Elise Stefanik of the North Country continues to support the assertion that the election was was rigged in many ways. So can you talk about what's going on with her? Yes. And I would just correct your phrasing. Uh, the president was not impeached twice this week. He's been impeached a second time, unless, of course, he is impeached a second time this week uh, between when we record this podcast and it actually goes up. but Well, that would certainly be a historical thing. That would be even more historic, yes. But um, Elise Stefanik, the uh, congresswoman from the North Country who is young and seen as or had been seen as a vibrant uh, you know, female face for the Republican Party, did a very good job supporting and recruiting in a couple of cases, uh, female candidates, um, some of whom did manage to make it into the House, is facing significant criticism and blowback from some quarters for her 
continued insistence on debunked claims and beyond legally suspect assertions about November's election. Tens of millions of Americans are concerned that the 2020 election featured unconstitutional overreach by unelected state officials and judges ignoring state election laws. She has been consistent in those objections and she has doubled down on them despite the fact that those very same claims made by the president and uh, other of his supporters far, of course, beyond Elise Stefanik, are what drove the the raid on the Capitol. She has denounced the violence, but she has not backed off at all some of these claims. Her office, as we've discussed, has failed to even explain some of them. Her staff can't uh, explain, for example, what she was talking about when she told constituents that Uh, 140,000 voters in Fulton County, which is essentially Atlanta, Georgia, uh, should not have been able to vote. That, of course, is is voter fraud that she's talking about. And there is absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. She faced blowback this week when a subdivision of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government bounced her from its advisory board for making exactly those claims, claims that as the dean of the school pointed out, has no basis in evidence whatsoever. In an example of kind of turning your frown upside down, Stefanik said that it was a badge of honor to be ostracized, to be canceled, to use the the term du jour, by a school that had, in her estimation, bowed to the, the woke left mob. You're going to talk more about the situation with Representative Lee Stefanik on our Capcom podcast, our sister podcast. So check that out if you get a chance. Uh, Moving back to the state capitol here in Albany this week, it was a somewhat unusual state of the state address from Governor Andrew Cuomo. Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? Yeah. In another example, a couple of years ago, the governor kind of took the state of the state on the road to various uh, places, you know, sites around the state. (laughs) This time around, he basically uh, chopped up the significant annual address, which lays out his agenda and um, spread it out over four days. All of these kind of mini addresses delivered from the war room, which is, you know, this beautiful, uh, heavily illustrated uh, room very close to the executive chamber corridor on the on the second floor of the Capitol. We faced a lot this year. We were ambushed by COVID and waged a war of life and death. But we are New Yorkers, so we faced it head on and we faced it together. The war isn't over. The virus still rages, but we will overcome. That's what New Yorkers do. You know, touching on, of course, topics, the, the leading one, the theme really that ran through them all, was a building back stronger from the effects of the pandemic. Um, I, I would say, I think it's fair to say that each of these addresses kind of focused more on big, broad ideas. And there was a lot of very strong rhetoric. Uh, the word excelsior was used a lot. And subjects that he, that he touched upon included how to bring, for example, the entertainment sector back to bring back large events that, of course, New York is so is so well known for, uh, and uh, also a plan to establish a much more robust kind of green energy uh, power grid, really running uh, all the way from Long Island up to the Canadian border and out west. There was uh, uh, the kind of repeating, but still it was nice to hear, that the port of Albany will become a center for uh, the development of wind power to the tune of uh, potentially as as many as 500 jobs. That is always uh, great to hear here in the capital region. But Thursday was the last one, and we think the governor is done now. Once again, for more on the state of the state, you can check out our CapCon podcast or our CapCon blog at timesunion.com. Now, moving more locally here in Albany, again, there have been some developments in the case of an Albany policeman caught on tape making racist statements. Can you elaborate? Yeah, this is David Haupt, who's an Albany um, police officer who, as you noted, was caught by a sheriff's deputy, or not caught by a sheriff's deputy, but captured on the body cam video 
um, of a sheriff's deputy who he was riding along with, making just hideous racist statements about black people, referring to them as the worst effing race. He immediately, once the, this video came to light, faced discipline. Steve Hughes, who is uh, one of our uh, outstanding Albany reporters, uh, foiled for his full personnel record, a personnel record that I would point out is only uh, available to the public because of the demise of 50A, which was the state law that previously barred the release of you know almost all disciplinary records of public safety officers. And what it showed is that Officer Haupt, even before this episode, had a fairly lousy disciplinary record, especially in regards to his not allegedly being able to meet minimal standards of of performance for a police officer, that he would blow off taking reports, that he would not do anything close to the minimal job you need to in responding to things like 9-11 calls, that uh, the one good thing that, um, that was said about him in performance reviews is that he was perfectly happy uh, to do desk work, which is something that a lot of other officers would prefer not to do because it was um, so boring. And uh, Officer Haupt was, uh, was perfectly game for that. But it begs the question of how this guy remained a police officer as long as he did. You know, city leaders and police officers or police leadership have said that they absolutely want to see him bounce. They do not want to see him in uniform again. That's a big local story there. But we are going to move uh, just briefly over to Pennsylvania. I know that sounds weird. But in Pennsylvania, uh, a woman living there found uh, a captured Nazi flag that uh, has some signatures on it. And one of them is a former World War II soldier from Saratoga. Can you tell us the rest of that story? It was actually in her kitchen in a stone fireplace. She discovered a, a metal box that was kind of stashed in a, in a corner of this fireplace in this Pennsylvania home. And what did she, she find inside it but a Nazi flag? And of course, initially she was rather concerned, made her wonder about perhaps the previous owner of her home. But once she unfolded it, she realized that it had been signed by soldiers from the U.S. Army's 385th Regiment with a note, uh, as Wendy Libertor noted, uh, that read, may this flag never fly again. And it turned out that one of the signatories of that flag is the late Jack Shallon, who lived in Saratoga Springs. And uh, we spoke to his nephew, who just gave a fantastic description of what sounds like the ultimate dashing dream uncle (laughs) that everybody should have. He called him, uh, Uncle Jack was the essence of cool. V-neck sweater, a GQ look, hair parted perfectly. He used to tell my father to come to the city. We'll go see Babs. And by Babs, he meant Barbara Streisand. So (laughs) I've got some great uncles, but this guy sounds pretty special. Absolutely. You can read more about that story on timesunion.com. And lastly, we're going to talk about vaccines now. There's a lot of news. I'm not even going to parse it out for you. I'm just going to give this to you and say there's a lot of news vis-a-vis vaccines. What's the latest? Well, the latest is that the state really kind of prompted by federal advisories is now opening up at least its reservation process for vaccines to people who are 65 and older, including uh, as well people who have you know potential comorbidities that might make them especially vulnerable to COVID-19. Now, Obviously, right now, demand is vastly outstripping supply, but there were encouraging signs this week, not only in the sense that the state is now uh, has made the pivot to lean more on county resources to get the vaccines out, but also at UAlbany, there was the opening of a massive vaccination site that has begun to get delivered sort of the largest share of of the county's uh, available doses. So the system, after a really frustrating rollout for a lot of people who either couldn't get on, couldn't get reservations, has begun to to kind of ramp up to put doses in arms. While we're on the topic, this 
Tuesday night, last Tuesday night, you helmed a panel on the topic of vaccine hesitancy among communities of color here in the Capital Region and beyond. We're going to play a segment of that panel after this, but I wondered if you could sort of tee it up for us. Yeah, well, this is coming off of a really terrific story that Bethany Bump did for us um, last weekend. And it, it is on the problem of, as you note, vaccine hesitancy, which is the reluctance of many people within communities of color, specifically Black and um, Latino Americans, to be uh, concerned to have reservations about getting vaccines, whether it's the very basic annual flu vaccine or something far more uh, you know, fast to market like the COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of that relates to tragic, shameful episodes in American history such as the Tuskegee experiment, where a group of black men were essentially allowed to decline and die from the effects of syphilis, which even then was an easily treated condition, a shameful episode that that, uh, smacks of the ugly history of, of eugenics in this country. That's not the only example, but it's one reason why some people in minoritized communities have real concerns when it comes to lining up for a vaccine. Now, on that panel, we had um, outstanding local leaders like Carolyn McLaughlin, a longtime city and now county elected official who said that she was, when her name came up, that she was eligible, she rolled up her sleeve right right away. And she is doing her part to kind of spread the word within her community, which is Albany South End, that It's important for everyone to get the vaccine in no small part to help reduce, you know, racial health inequities that have been pointed up all throughout the coronavirus pandemic. So we're going to hear a segment from that panel now. And the segment that we're about to play features Carolyn McLaughlin, as you described. It also features Angela Antonikowski, who is Albany Med's chief diversity officer. And it also features Wilma Alvarado Little of the New York State Department of Health. So before we jump over to that, Casey, we'll talk to you next week. Great. Thanks, Jess. To start up, I really wanted to turn to, to Carolyn McLaughlin to talk a little bit about her understanding of vaccine hesitancy, how it plays out on the ground in Albany, and if you could, perhaps some of the reasons behind it. You know, Bethany Bump had a story that appeared in print in Sunday's Times Union and is online right now that, of course, goes back to things like the Tuskegee experiment and other examples of situations in which People of color across this country have ample reason to be concerned about government medicine. Even as I speak to individuals in groups or as um, just one-on-one, the overriding theme seems to be they just don't trust the vaccine. And not just the vaccine, they don't trust the government. And the first thing that people bring up is the Tuskegee experiment. And then of late, I've heard people speak of Henrietta Lacks, who her her cells were, and they're still being used. This was like 60 years after after her death. Her cells are still being used to experiment um, and do research, some research that has been very good, but nonetheless, her cells were harvested without her permission. So it's those kinds of things that people are bringing up as they talk about their hesitancy to be um, vaccinated. While the average, I think, in the country is like 62 to 65 percent people say they will take the vaccine. In the African-American community, that hovers around 42 percent. And why is that? I mean, people are talking about the side effects. They think they're going to become sterile. They think they believe that they're going to get sick immediately. They believe that the vaccine contains COVID-19 and they will be experimented experimented upon. They believe that the vaccine was developed too quickly, not understanding that there were, uh, there was research in place years ago to deal with this and it just got speeded up. And they just think it's too new and they wanna wait and see. And then just politics in general, they believe that that played a role 
um, in it getting out so fast. So just some very basic things that you have to give credence to when you talk to people because the Tuskegee experiment was a government sponsored study that um, people were told to put their trust in. And you know, it was an institutional initiative. And that's how people look at the vaccine. It's a government initiative. And if you're looking, if you don't trust the government, how are you going to trust them to give you a vaccine that is actually going to make you healthy? But also looking at the health disparities that were identified when the pandemic was declared why are you so concerned about me now when you weren't concerned about me prior to the pandemic? These are the kinds of things that I'm hearing from people. And how do you respond to that? And I'm not, I don't work hard to convince. I work hard to educate people about why they should consider taking the vaccine. And um, so, but there's so much that uh, we have to overcome we, we hear so much about, about fake news and knowing how, uh, you know, paranoia can, can grow online, knowing that this is sort of a pre-existing, um, you know, problem in society, especially among communities of color. And I would throw this out to, to Wilmer or anyone else on, else on the panel. Is this, pro is this problem growing worse, uh, you know, because of the digital wonderland where misinformation can, can spread so readily? At the uh, um, New York State Department of Health, you know, there's three pillars that, that are discussed. You know, the, the, that vaccine is, you know, at the end of the day, it's safe, it's effective, and the distribution of the vaccine is going to be equitable. We're doing everything we can to ensure that our communities have whatever information we have. You know, the governor has been very forthcoming with all the information that he has. He has based everything on data, facts, and science. And so it is now our role to take that message and continue to move it forward within our communities. And as um, many, many of the uh, colleagues here on the panel are trusted members of the community, we need to be able to be sure that we have our information correct and not fill in information in the absence of facts. So for example, if we don't know, it's okay not to know because mm -hmm. we cannot say something that is not based on science, you know, in a way that's no matter of fact. That is doing an injustice to our communities who have already experienced situations such as Tuskegee, such as the sterilization of women in Puerto Rico, such as the Guatemalans in the country of Guatemala who are also part of the Tuskegee experiment and who in 2010, President Obama apologized to the Guatemalan government. So the, within the Latino community, this information is there. And so how can, and let's not, you know, if we're gonna go talk about that, let's talk about what happened in the ICE detention centers to women as well. These are all government attached and we need to be very careful in our messaging and also very careful in, in the information that we, when we are blessed with being trusted by our communities, share information with them in a way that is culturally and linguistically relevant. So for the, the folks on the panel who, who do work at either large educational institutions or in the case of Angela, Albany Med, which is, of course, the dominant, you know, healthcare provider in the capital region, you know, what can those large institutions do? Um, what can they do in terms of, of outreach and messaging to th these communities where there is this trust gap? Well, you know, I, I think just piggybacking on what Wilma and Carolyn had said that, you know, our approaches have to be culturally specific. And so for a very long time, the approaches and the practices and the policies which we use haven't been used or developed with minoritized communities in mind. And so uh, an, an important piece is that our policies and practices have to be developed and implemented with minoritized communities in mind. And so what that may mean is that uh, may, maybe that information doesn't come from the primary doc. Maybe it comes from the pharmacy. 
Maybe that information comes from the person in the barbershop. Maybe that comes from an individual in, in the clergy. But, but we certainly have to recognize and, and interrogate how our practices uh, create a further barrier. I mean, what, one of the things we know, we, we know a lot of things about vaccine hesitancy, but one of the things that we know is that it's a combination of uh, vaccine literacy, right? So how much you know about what messenger RNA is. Vaccine e efficacy knowledge, so how much you know about how effective it is, and healthcare trust. So we, so, so policies and practices around increasing acceptance of the vaccine have to take all of those factors in mind. We have to provide education on the vaccine itself, on knowledge, but then we have to reconcile ourselves with the healthcare trust piece. And so our communities not only know this historical backdrop, as we've talked about, but in their everyday experiences in waiting rooms, we've experienced, I've experienced medical mistrust. And so what we do in times of abundance uh, uh, can, can inform what happens during times of famine. We are in times of famine and we're reconciling uh, this healthcare mistrust in the past that, that is fueling now this vaccine hesitancy now. We really have to reconcile and have some, some, some truth telling around how healthcare can engender trust in, in communities in ways that are culturally um, in, in, in informed. And it may look different because, because many of our policies and practices aren't always culturally informed. After the break, we'll find out how Russell Sage College weathered the pandemic. Hi, I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union. Join us for an ongoing discussion on major developments in the saga of Keith Raniere, co-founder of Nexium, the shadowy upstate New York organization at the center of the explosive federal investigation that resulted in his conviction on charges of extortion, sex trafficking, and more. We talk to former members of Nexium, discuss the latest news, and preview the likely next twists in this bizarre and disturbing story. You can find Nexium on trial at timesunion.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. Across the Capital Region, small private colleges have struggled with financial woes in the last several years. On top of that, they've had the added burden of the COVID-19 pandemic, which in some cases has prompted layoffs and program cuts. But Russell Sage College President Christopher Ames says the Troy-based college has weathered the storm thus far. Times Union education reporter Rachel Silberstein recently spoke with Ames about how the institution overcame their financial woes and responded to the pandemic. You know, in 2017, the college was dealing with a deficit of 4.8 million, right? And that was when you came on as president. Can you tell me what happened or what was the situation the college was in then? They had a couple of years that sort of ballooned into a large deficit. You know, the deficit sort of emerged between the time I was hired and when I started. So I walked into a, a situation where that, of course, was the number one priority to uh, maintain the fiscal health. And it took us a couple of years to get the ship completely righted, but we've had uh, multi-million dollar surpluses for the last two years. And you know, we got there by pretty simple ways. We improved our whole structure for managing budgets. We cut expenses. Um, but we did that uh, pretty systematically. So some of the things that other institutions did, we, we did eliminate some programs, but we did that in a multi-year process. Um, so we didn't have any uh, dismissal of faculty members. It was done through attrition and, and reassignment, but, but we got a better match between the overall size of staff and faculty and the size of the institution that we were. Uh, and made some other cuts that were a little tough and we're starting to work back funding for some of those things. There's also kind of a rebranding, right? Is there, is that when the new name 
Well, yes, absolutely. At the same time, we were talking about a strategic plan, which is how do we grow our enrollment? How do we uh, Im improve our name recognition in the area? SAGE, part of its strength is it had been so many different things. We'd responded. It was originally, of course, a women's college. That's key to uh, its identity and its origin. That was the Russell Sage College campus in Troy. But the junior college in, in Albany had been there for 40 years and had become a four-year co-ed institution. Uh, we'd increasingly had graduate programs. We'd always had professional programs. Now about half our students are graduate students. So if you talk to different people in the region, you got a half dozen different views of, of what is the Sage Colleges. So we did rebrand it going back to our original name, uniting our Albany and Troy campuses. So they're all part of the same college with the same curriculum. The students can move back and forth uh, freely. Uh, it's entirely co-ed, but still dedicated to that social equity mission upon which it was founded. Uh, we have had uh, no layoffs or furloughs at SAGE. Every single one of our employees wants to stay here has been able to, to stay and work, some remotely, some on campus and so forth. So I think that's been a real success story for us. And I mean, that's really exceptional. I don't know of another institution in the region that hasn't had to lay people off or, or furlough people, at least during that break when campuses were closed. We knew it was temporary. And yes, you could take the strategy, you're gonna let people go and bring them back when, when you can. Um, but, you know, we had made the cuts earlier to reduce our workforce size, which meant we were working with a lean workforce. I think some other colleges, it's natural when times are good, you grow your, your staff a lot. And then sometimes when, uh, you know, revenue is challenged, you have to cut back and there's that back and forth. But we've asked a lot out of our employees to work with the smaller staff. So we wanted to be uh, loyal to them during this difficult time. I am curious about shifting remote because I know you have a lot of medical professions. You train people for medical professions and a lot of it is you know, occupational therapy. It requires a lot of hands-on training. How did you adjust to that? Uh, well, we had to be very creative. And I think one of the, the themes here is that as a small institution, we've been able to change quickly and, and be creative with modest resources. Uh, we did that in a variety of ways. We kept up the clinicals as much as we could, but when, when hospitals and other medical sites became overloaded. Of course, the clinical experiences were shut down. Um, we created simulation uh, experiments, both online, well, primarily online. In some cases uh, with our graduate programs, some of the experiences had to be postponed and got picked up in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all those students have been caught up uh, with their experiences. We worked with all the professional associations because they were dealing with this across the country uh, for ways to make exceptions, uh, alternative ways to fulfill um, clinicals. On some of the graduate programs, we shifted the order of classes uh, for what people were taking to allow people to get the clinicals. And then this fall, people have been able to have um, their clinical experiences. Am I remembering this correctly? Some of your students, a lot of them are nurses and they were actually on the front lines at first helping out with the effort in sort of hot spots. Can you, can you talk about that? Absolutely. Well, that's been, been true. And I think, you know, there are a variety of benefits that we've had experienced because such a large portion of our uh, students are involved in the health professions and particularly nursing at the undergraduate and graduate level. Most of our master's students are employed nurses and, right. and they're getting their master's degrees. So they were working at, at all kinds of, you know, uh, hospitals, emergency rooms and clinics uh, and, and, and so forth, as well as pursuing their classes. Um, we also have the experience, there are really some dramatic and moving stories too from uh, our educational leadership program, which is uh, students in the capital region and in New York City who are fairly high level educational administrators getting their doctorate in educational leadership. So we had people who were New York City principals working out the pandemic while they were finishing their thesis uh, here and, and really dedicated people. They wouldn't be where they were if they, if they, if they weren't. We also have been you know, using our nursing faculty to assist with the testing we conduct on campus. Uh, we're currently working with Albany Med for some of our nursing students to assist with vaccinations. We uh, worked with the National Guard. We turned over our armory. It's an old armory that we use for athletic practices and gatherings on our Albany campus. And the National Guard used that in um, uh, spring and summer for the assembling of testing kits. Looking forward, I guess, um, any expenses you anticipate, you know, it's going to be such a different 
situation in next month when students return? Yeah, um, well, there are a couple things. Well, as I said, we're expanding our surveillance testing. Uh, we have a plan. It's going to depend on the public health uh, situation to resume athletic competition in March. Um, that involves testing athletes three times a week uh, when they begin practicing and through um, the whole period. So we're prepared for that. Um, you know, as you know, the CARES Act has provided another round of funding. And so that is very helpful for being able to sustain testing. And half of that funding, at least, will go directly to students uh, as well. So that, that is a plus. It's something that they really need. Um, in terms of the vaccine, we have uh, done the initial paperwork to be a vaccination site. Um, it's, I think, up in the air about how the state's going to manage this really complicated logistic situation, but they were asking colleges if they were willing to do that. And they did ask you if you were willing to be a site to vaccinate your own community, if you're willing to be a site to vaccinate a larger community. Uh, we've indicated our interest in doing a larger community. All right. And I guess, you, you know, the restrictions are probably going to be a little bit more tighter given the situation in the capital region. Sort of we're seeing record cases. Um, are you prepared for that? Like, how are you preparing for? Yeah, for well, I think one of the things we learned very quickly, if you go back to last March, when the regulations changed like three times in one week, yeah. is uh, you've got to be flexible. You've got to plan for different scenarios. We have done that. Obviously, like a lot of colleges last spring, we were able to switch to remote. If we have to do that, if that's what the public health situation demands, uh, we're prepared to do that and we're prepared to do even a better job with it this time around. That's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Albany Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. 